Hi, this is Richard Fairgray, the creator of Octopus, a memoir of flailing, currently on Kickstarter at kickrichard.com. I'm on all social media as Richard Fairgray or at Richard Fairgray. I'm the only one in the whole world, so I'm pretty easy to find. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today on another episode with a very talented and creative individual. He has been on the show in the past before. In fact, his very first interview is going to be posted in at the end of May of this year. He is back for, of course, a very personal and wonderful comic called Octopus. A memoir of flailing, which is still an amazing title. Joined today by the ever talented Richard Fairgray. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm really impressed by your uh, your ability to like rattle off that intro the way you do, and kind of like I, I think if you can do that at McDonald's in under thirty seconds, you get a free Big Mac. <laughs> I enjoy it whenever I'm doing an interview with anyone when they have like that patter that's so quick. I'm like I, I want to like find your first ever episode and then like hear the oh, like two the long version and see if I can recut it to match the new one. Like re-editing the different versions of China Girl to match each other's <laughs> videos. Someone did that. That someone actually did that. I'm not. I'm not making up a thing. I, 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 it actually might just be a friend of mine, and I can't possibly imagine who else would have. So let's dive deep into the the disaster piece that is Richard Faircraft. <laughs> It's funny, I've heard you on other interviews as well too and the various Twitter spaces and all that other fun stuff. You have a common phrase that you've been saying recently and that is you make fun of yourself so that you apologize for yourself as well too. So I was just agreeing, yes, I do do that. <laughs> but the question is why and how does that attribute to the comic and memoir you've created? It's not so much making fun of myself to apologize for myself, it's more I make work to apologize for existing. Hmm. I think a lot of creative people feel like they're struggling to be understood by other people. They feel like they're getting things wrong. They're seeing the world from some slightly altered viewpoint or different interpretation. And no one likes to be the person who says, oh, I don't understand the context. I don't know what's going on here. Can someone re-explain the world to me? So instead we stay quiet and we put our heads down and we make as much work as humanly possible in the hope that our unpleasantness in social situations will be made up for by the work that we hand over. Like my husband always tells me that you are very good at parties. People enjoy your company. Mm -hmm. People enjoy talking to you. You make friends easily. And my interpretation of that is I come away from every conversation thinking, oh shit, everyone must hate every single thing I said there. And then I will go over it in my head for the next um, 30 years. Mm. You know, there's the meme, like I have never gotten over anything that's ever happened to me. <laughs> yeah. It's I have never gotten over anything that I have ever gotten wrong or said wrong. And I, I know all of them. I was seven years old when I got in trouble for like some stuff, doesn't matter. And I was being told off by my school principal and he was t giving me my punishment. And I tried to like bargain for a different punishment. <laughs> And he said, this isn't a time to, for negotiating. And I said, I'm not negotiating. I'm trying to make a deal because I was a seven year old. and I didn't know the word negotiating and I'm still embarrassed because it means that that man is out there somewhere and he'll see one of my books on a shelf and he'll be like, <laughs> Richard Fairgray writing books. He doesn't even know what negotiating is, <laughs> idiot. And he'll tell 10 friends. Or he may not be around. <laughs> I, you know, look, fingers crossed. <laughs> And that's just a small glimpse into your life, especially when it comes to this particular comic as well, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always used to say that I don't enjoy small talk. So I, my, my deepest hope is that if I meet someone new, I want something bad to have happened to me, something bad to have happened to them, or a shared terrible experience, like an explosion nearby, so that we can immediately bond. When I meet someone new, what I tend to do is be like, hi, I'm Richard, here's an awful thing, here's as much information about me as humanly possible, incredibly fast, are we okay yet? And as I've gotten older, I've learned to stop doing that and instead turn it into stories and make more and more books and hand them to, to the world and say, D do you get it now, am I, am I okay, can I? Can, can I stay? Should I leave? What What do you want? Here's another book, I promise. It's all gonna be okay. Here's two and a half thousand pages of comics for free on it because I'm sorry for existing. Well, I did mention in my tweet that you do apologize more than a Canadian, so that is saying something. Um, wow. I mean, my husband's Canadian and he never apologizes. BC, yeah. home of yeah. um, hippies and uh, forest. <laughs> They're putting in a, um, 
They're putting in a Costco across the street from us. Oh. It'll technically be like, it'll be our actual next door neighbor because uh, we're in a cul-de-sac. So I'm excited about that because it'll mean 18 months of heavy construction and then a lot of really intense traffic on our very narrow street. But walking distance to hot dog and a Pepsi for a buck 50. So win-win, right? I'm only there for the dogs, man. Did I ever tell you I once, I had sex with this guy and he had a tattoo on his hip of a little cartoon hot dog and a little cartoon can of Coke. And it said a buck 25, because back then they were cheaper and they had Coke. I almost married that man on the spot. Like that's I was like that's the best tattoo a person can ever have. So then looking at the book itself here that you've created, let's talk about the title. Why is that an important title and how does that signify your life? I've had this recurring nightmare since I was very young that I was turning into an octopus. Hmm. I think that there are a lot of like, very easy interpretations of that of like, you know, I leave ink stains everywhere, or I'm working on too many different projects, and it's like having arms in all directions. It comes down to what we were just talking about. Like, I always feel like I am too loud, too obnoxious, taking up too much space. I'm going to be the thing people remember, but they may not remember it. It's that when you're standing around in a group and everyone's laughing and you're telling a good story and you see one person looks disinterested and it breaks you because you realize that, oh, you're seeing me for the garbage that I am. You're, oh, I let a tentacle fall out somewhere. I have revealed myself to be an octopus. And so through the book, I am the octopus flailing wildly to try and grab onto anything I can to form a life. The story is set across an 18 month period where told out of order for reasons that become apparent in the story, but it basically covers like, me being in this really shitty abusive relationship and remaining in it. <laughs> a suicide attempt by stealing a boat, a lot of sex clubs, a divorce, an end of a really toxic friendship that I'd held on to for a decade, moving to Hollywood, meeting a nice man, trying to push him away because I was worried that I would like destroy him because he was nice, uh, and eventually kind of coming to terms with the fact that, that I was okay, that he actually, he didn't see me as like, this fun new toy he saw me as a deeply flawed person who he also liked and cared about this period of like not knowing what country i'm going to be in tomorrow not knowing what my job is anymore because i quit like my jobs with publishers and i quit my self-publishing stuff and i packed up my bags and moved away in the space of four days who knows what anything's going to be it is the memoir of the time when i was flailing the most and i think when you're flailing the most you grab onto anything and sometimes that's an adventure so then what have you learned about yourself through finally getting this out there no matter how far away from it I am, I am always very close to falling back into it, mm. or at least emotionally falling back into it. I made the book, you know, it's all set from 2000, uh, end of 2015 to mid 2017. Mm -hmm. And I uh, wrote it and drew it in the first two months of lockdown. That was a very introspective time, but it was also a point where I didn't think anyone was ever going to see it because various people who give advice to me and guide my career a little bit said to me, you cannot show this to anyone because you work in children's publishing and you do all ages comics and this will end your career. Hmm. And I said, oh, okay, I won't. And so I hit it. I was about halfway through when that happened. I just started making it entirely for me. It was some form of therapy, some form of burning away all of the old scar tissue of my life and some form of just like being really focused on what the world was like uh before everything got so isolating i wasn't going to release it there were a couple things that happened in the past year one publisher treating me with like very little respect kind of really pushing me to get back into being in control of things people trying to say that you know i cannot publicly be myself there's a sense i sometimes get from people who are looking at me as a place they can make money from where they're saying if we just sanded down the edges a little bit we could make money from him so we have to make sure those things don't show. And I don't like being altered like that. I don't like being used like that, I guess, is a kind of extreme way to say it, but it's where I'm at. When I launched Haunted Hill last year, it got a really positive response. And a lot of people reached out saying that seeing a character like Eva, who's so deeply flawed and always kind of right and so sloppy was really important to them because they didn't see themselves represented. And so I decided I was going to do a Kickstarter for Haunted Hill and got all of that prepared. I realized that I was terrified because I'd never done a Kickstarter on my own before. I'd had Shed come out through Blue Fox that Lucy and I wrote right. and Blue Fox handled all of it and they have their own built-in audience and all of that. And it was an absolute cakewalk for us, but this was new and scary and big and whatever. I have this mantra, I guess, that if something scares you, do something scarier. Mm -hmm. And that way the thing you want to do will seem easy. And this was the scariest book to possibly release. So instead of doing Haunted Hill in March, 
March, like I planned, I'm doing Octopus in January <laughs> and putting a book out to the world that is like, it's really fun. It is like, like, it's not a sad story. It's a really hopeful story. It's about love. It's about sex. It's about always making the choice that will end with the, the better story. But it's also like very open. It's very honest. And I'm certainly not the hero of it. You know, it's hard to put yourself out there, not only as a creative person, but as a person. Mm. But when you're a creative person, you're constantly putting yourself out there, whether it's social media, whether it's the products you're creating, whether it's the comics you're creating, some bits of yourself are always showcased. You're just taking it to that next level and actually really showcasing a, a painful part of your life, but you've survived and you've made it through. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate goal for creating any type of not only memoir, but, but comic. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, I don't really think of it as a painful part of my life, though. That's what's so strange about it. Mm. While there was a lot of bad stuff going on, everything was moving so fast. There was no time to think about whether it was bad or not. I tend to have this life where things... I don't know why this happens. I've been described by people as a shit magnet before. <laughs> Adventure seems to happen at me a lot of the time. And when people are talking about too many coincidences, I, I always feel like they're talking about me. Here's a story that's not in the book, but it's kind of an example of it. My marriage had been like over for a long time. We were terrible for each other. Like we were awful for each other. We made each other miserable. When I was at a convention, I called my wife. I said, how are you? I hadn't spoken to her for probably four days at that point. And she said, I'm not good. I think our marriage is over. And I said, yeah, that sounds right. Hung up the phone because I then arrived at the door of the place where I was going to like have a three-way with two dudes I'd met on Grinder. <sighs> then went straight to a party where I had like a cocktail party signing event where I was signing books and then kind of forgot to think about it again until I got home th th three days later. I don't know why there was so much stuff going on. I didn't have time to stop and think, oh, this is a big life-changing event. Yeah. A week after that, I got an email that just said, hey, Richard, it's Joe. I'm in town. Do you want to have dinner? And I was like, I have no idea who Joe is. So I said, sure went and met this person at their hotel, I gave me a big hug and said, Richard, it's so good to see you. I'm like, I have no idea who this man is. Mm -hmm. He is stuck in New Zealand living in this hotel because the runway at the resort that he's meant to be going to is too short for the plane he was meant to be taking. So now he's gonna live in New Zealand for a month and asked if I wanna live in the hotel with him. I'm like, sure. And it's now too late to ask how we know each other. And I kept trying to figure it out for like the entire time I was there and never could. It is flailing. I'm, I'm, I'm flailing from one thing to the next. And it, it, as long as I'm never bored, <laughs> it's all gonna be okay. And I think I had a really, yeah, bad shit happened. And I had a really fun time. I talk about the suicide attempt and it was, I don't know, like I was so overwhelmed with stress. I had so many things going on. I had finally made the decision to try and like get beyond New Zealand with my books because I had 200 books out at this point mm -hmm. there. I was like, fuck it. I'm gonna go to LA for let's say six weeks and see what happens. There is no plan in place. And now I'm gonna make a bunch of stuff. And suddenly all of these things start falling into place. I have all these meetings getting lined up for me. I'm having to create new stuff for those meetings and new ideas to pitch and animated opening titles for comics and everything, 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 and continue going to conventions and continue putting out my work online. And I'm so terrified because everyone keeps saying to me, do you know anyone in LA who has influence who could help you? And the answer is yes, my ex, the love of my life, who I have maintained an online relationship with now for almost a decade after like one of the messiest points in my past. It is the relationship that I've never gotten over and I still don't know whether I loved him or I loved the life that I had when I was with him because when I moved to Australia to be with him, I was then working essentially as his assistant on the set of a major film and that felt really magical and weird in a way that nothing as a 22 year old had felt before. So realizing that like because of the way that everything had gone wrong with that and then later everything had gone wrong with Blastosaurus with the Top Cow imprint American original that we were the flagship title for. If you don't know what happened there, like it's a fucking disaster. <laughs> Misprinted books, me sharing a hotel room with the meth addict wrestler, uh, a lot of crying in a toilet and yelling at Chris Claremont because I thought he was someone else. I now avoid him. Like if I see Chris Claremont at a con, I just turn and walk the other way. I'm 200 pounds lighter and I don't have a beard or long hair anymore. So he probably wouldn't know it was me, but still I'm the crazy person who yelled at him at a convention one time a lot. I was 24, it was a different time. Anyway, that the only way to succeed, people were telling me was to go back into that feeling was too much. And I was at a convention, we went out drinking afterwards, 
It was me and a bunch of Australian comic guys. My buddy Tom has this fixation with karaoke. So we go and do karaoke. I close my eyes while singing Doll Parts by Hole, one of my favorite songs. Everyone kind of snuck out. Um, and I find myself wandering around later. Like everyone goes home. It's early in the morning. I'm by a river and I see a boat and I think, well, I got fucked by a sea captain the other day and he said that when you're fed up with the world you know get to sea as in moby dick one of my favorite books because i'm boring maybe this is a sign my phone is dead no one knows where i am and so i got in a boat tried to disappear at sea i'm bad at undoing knots and the boat just ended up going back and forth across the river for a while just kind of floating with a rope tied somewhere i've never figured out and eventually i would be like if i'm found starved to death because i stubbornly refuse to get out of this boat it's going to be too embarrassing so i will just go back to the convention and sell comics again for another day two days later i got an email from that ex and he was like hey i hear you're coming to la let me know if i can help in any way there was no drama i mean like then when i came to la he came to meet me at my friend's place where i was staying this man is like when we got together, he was 62, so he's now 72 years old. I open the door and he looks at me and he goes, oh, you've aged so much. Um, so he was great. We went out to lunch. We had a really nice conversation. Everything was normal. He came to drop me back off. And then like we ended up making out in his car for so long that the battery went dead and he had to get his husband to drive from Malibu to Van Nuys to pick him up. But you know, it's fine. <laughs> life finds you. I, I don't think it's shit happens. I think life finds you and makes your life part of the flow. It's just incredible what you've gone through, what you're continuing to do and to create, go through. And now that you're, you're putting it all together in this memoir, at least I don't know what you're going to do next. That's the crazy thing. <laughs> It's, you know, it's, it's interesting, like, I think, you know, to jump all the way back to the idea of like apologizing with work or like trying to, you know, we're creating stuff so people understand us. Like every creative person is doing, I think on some level, like you are putting out a podcast where you, your face is seen, you're talking every week or significantly more than every week. You want to be understood. That is the like underlying craving of it, right? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I've done it for so long. I think it's kind of blended into just my own personality, but yeah, in yeah. some way, shape or form, I want to leave an imprint on the world, however small it may be. Like, I think there are people who want fame. There are people who want like the glory or the admiration or whatever. I think that at the heart of it, like people who are creating, who can't help but create no matter what level it's at, mm. they are doing it so that someone will see it and go, I understand this writer, this artist, this producer, this musician, whatever. I want to know them. And we all know what it feels like when we listen to a show and we start feeling like we're friends with the people on the show because we hear them talk every week. Yeah you get invested in their lives. And I think that's a, that's a good feeling. I think it goes to unhealthy places a lot of the time, obviously. There are some crazy stories in the world of how that plays out. It's so hard because it is what we want. We want people to know us. We want to feel like we're understood. I always say that like love is the feeling that you're taking up more space in the world because you exist in two places. Because somewhere, no matter how far away they are from you, someone who loves you has your best interests at heart and they are thinking about you or making decisions based on what would make you happier or make your life better and when you have a breakup when the love goes away it's not just that you've gotten one person smaller it's you've gotten the entire distance of the space between the negative space between you and another person has been deactivated that is what makes you feel alone you're disconnected from an imaginary force but i think that like putting out octopus first is really like this ultimate attempt at saying like how many times have you heard this when what your particular situation is but like if you have a manager or an agent like anyone who's trying to like craft what you do or give you advice they're always like you are the brand you have to get your personality out there and then you the whole like celebrity first of it all that like had the, the shift in culture now i don't want to do that that sounds awful like courtney love describes it as like you're 360 living or something essentially you're viewed from every angle at all times right. unless you go completely off the grid i don't want to be a part of that I want to be able to make my work to explain myself. I want to be able to explain who I am with my work and Octopus can do that. And if people like Octopus, I mean, a lot of people are gonna like Octopus because they've liked my other works before it. But if new people find Octopus and they'll go, oh, I know Richard now. I understand what Richard cares about. I understand the driving force behind these things. And I hope that if people read it, they will then read the rest of my things and say, I get this guy. You know, a lot of my works are really weird. My art style is very deliberate, but very sloppy. I'm a very, not to brag, I'm a very good visual storyteller, but I'm not a technically proficient. I think that, you know, I, I want to ease people into it. You know, I'm doing, doing Haunted Hill in May. I'm doing a new book called Ex-Wives of Frankenstein in, in August, probably. 
I've got a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline that I'm really excited about, but it all kind of starts with Octopus. So I'm glad it's working so far. Well, and that's that's one of the reasons why I wanted to back it as well. Not only because you're, you are who you are, because you're a very talented artist and I've appreciated our conversations in the past as well too. The hot dog stories aside, I'm still remembering the first time you told me about the hot dogs. Like that's that still sticks in my brain after all this time. I'm really glad. See, I, so I do have a brand. <laughs> Oscar Mayer, there you go. Um, <laughs> from a creative side of things, you're you're a very detailed artist. I, I love what you've created, no matter what genre you're creating in, and the colors and and the even your black and white style of work, your your um, stippling and everything that you do is just beautiful. I just love what you do, so that's why I wanted to support this particular book as well too. And the fact that the campaign is now funded, which is wonderful congratulations on that thank you six hours it took that's that's the nail biting six hours it was but <laughs> but that blows my mind because because you put out so many works you have or you already have a fan base you already have people that appreciate what you've created and are willing to support you so i i don't see how how you can be down on yourself because you do so well with everything that you do because you've worked so hard to do so well I'm not, I'm, this is the thing. I, I, I don't know if I'm putting it across right. I mean, which again will make me feel terrible. Um, I'm not down on myself. Okay. I'm, I'm down on like, I'm, I'm down on the person. My friend Eddie always says, if you're not embarrassed of who you were five years ago, then you're not growing. Hmm. I think I've taken that to the next level of if you're not embarrassed of who you are half an hour ago, then you're not growing. So when I come away from a conversation, I will sit there and think, fuck. That Richard of the past is awful. He said terrible, and I, I've never said anything terrible. Everyone's always like, you're fine, you haven't, whatever. But like, there are certain topics that I get heated about. Um, there are certain things that I will tell people off about. And there are times when I will kind of go buck wild on self-righteous anger at uh, straight men and uh, the way they treat women and gays and the way that women of a certain age and gay men become invisible in certain parts of society. And those kind of conversations, I absolutely believe everything I'm saying. I also know it makes people not particularly enjoy talking to me because that's when I get the sighing and the eye rolling. And I don't give a single shit in the moment, but after it, I come away from it and I think, was there an easier way? I still like that person. They're not fundamentally bad. You know, conversation. It's what we all feel, right? I'm not over not knowing what negotiating meant when I was seven years old. The campaign funded in six hours. You have a lot of tiers, a lot of goals. When you were setting this up, what was your key product or key element besides the book that you wanted people to kind of say, wonder, wow, this is interesting, but why is this here? I know how expensive shipping is at the moment and will always be probably. And I know that there's probably a lot of people in New Zealand who would be interested in what I'm doing since I left there. So I wanted to have something that would be cheap to ship, but still a physical item because I don't read digital comics. I think most people intend to read digital comics and don't get around to it. So I wanted to have something that people could actually latch onto. And so I made this, this is my octopus in a bottle and it is a fake bottle of poppers for $20. You get this very limited edition bottle and inside it is the QR code for uh, about 400 pages of digital comics. That is, I'm so excited about that. Obviously, it's, it's great because it means you get to, if you don't normally have poppers on your bedside table, you're going to have to start explaining to people what poppers are, which is always fun for the viewers and listeners. It's a liquid, very, very toxic, flammable liquid, but you sniff it and the fumes from it make you excessively horny, euphoric, and it relaxes certain muscles. Mm -hmm to make certain activities easier and way more fun. They're pretty present in the book. The foil stamp variant cover I'm, I'm doing is literally just a tentacle flipping the lid off a bottle of poppers <laughs> uh, of my favorite brand or a, a tribute to my favorite brand to avoid copyright, Pig Sweat. Yeah, Octopus in a Bottle is that. It's to honor the heavy usage of poppers throughout <laughs> most of my books <laughs> and real life. And other people have pointed this out, but the joke I made when I was first putting it together was I love the image of someone like having a real big night and reaching for the poppers and right before someone ram jams something up there, they take a whiff of nothing but digital comics. <laughs> well, that's one way to get uh, digital comics straight to the brain. Uh, <laughs> I know people like collecting things. Everyone says, why don't you do this in issues? Everyone on Kickstarter likes collecting issues of things like, no, I want books. <laughs> and if I have to have a collectible, it's going to be something weird that no one else does. 
I'll do the pins, I'll do the buttons, I'll do the stickers, I'll do all the things that everyone else does. I won't do bookmarks because it's comic books, and if you need a bookmark when you're reading a comic book, I don't even know where to start. So I won't do bookmarks. No one should. I know they're cheap, but they're not a bonus. They're just trash that you're sending to people. There's actually a, a stretch goal that I'm, I haven't announced yet, but if we reach a certain level, I'm going to be having an add-on of another book that is a notebook of follow-ups on all the all the men in the book and where they are now. Oh, wow. Because there's a lot of real Buckwild stories. Some have happened since the book was done. Some just thematically didn't work in there. There's a story in there about a, a guy who I'm feeling really like down, like I'm never gonna have a great adventure again at some point. At one point in the story, I'd had this really weird weekend where not included, but my like my best friend and I had this huge argument about ghosts because he doesn't believe in them and said I was stupid for believing in them. And then we had to go to explore a cave and break into a house. I was feeling like very low and like that everything was calming down in my life. And I get back to Penn Station on the train and I get off and this guy like immediately approaches me and long story longer, I end up having like champagne and getting a hand job in a back office at Penn Station. And that's in the story. And that's like, that, it's, a, it's a wonderful moment. And I came away from it feeling like really happy and like, yes, these things still happen to me because I was wearing a, a big red coat uh, and it drew this guy's attention. What I don't include in there is the six months later when I'm watching a certain documentary and the villain is revealed. And I'm like, holy shit, that's the train station hand job guy. Oh, so geez. my friend once said that my butthole has been a camping ground for super villains. I mean, he never fucked me, but still, it's really, it's on brand. You'll have to buy the stretch goal book to find out which super villain he was. As you're talking about all of this stuff, I'm just thinking, how can I put this into a TikTok video? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's going to be good. I'm very happy with how it's going. You know, I've got two and a half thousand real dollars on my, on my first day, almost three and a half Canadian, three and a half thousand Canadian dollars, which is what it shows up for, for me. Cause Same. that's where I was set up the campaign. I think it, it, it bodes well that Haunted Hill will do well. Ex-Wives of Frankenstein will do well. The Lights to Guide You Home will do well. I'm just going to announce the things here. So I'm forced into making sure they come out. I've got eight books coming out this year and four of them will be through Kickstarter. And that's wow. quite exciting and terrifying and entirely new and fingers crossed it all works out if i was in it for the money i would have been a basketball player instead is there anything i haven't touched on you want to showcase or share with those that are watching and listening to this interview i can show you the, the book actually yeah, yeah, I, yeah. this is the the proof copy arrived from the printer like the day before the campaign oh, for the that, foil that's cover beautiful so yeah and i like like I went with a heavier paper stock and it's just, it's a, it's a thick, it's 144 pages. I did a little practice on the back to make sure the sketch cover paper worked for the, nice. I'm doing a, um, the foil stamp will be hundred copies all signed and numbered. And then the sketch covers will be 50. Uh, and I will draw an octopus tentacle holding anything you want, <laughs> uh, within reason, basically anything you want, cause it's me, you know? Um, but like, yeah, the, cause all of the art is. Uh, photographed instead of like not it's not scanned the normal way oh okay and so everything looks exactly like the original pages like there's really absolutely no there's just like no alteration to it incredibly happy with that how that all turned out you know it's a memoir from a comic creator that isn't about creating comics because i don't find that i think that's the most boring thing to spend time on to sort of uh, apologize for that i have uh left in all of the blue line around the yeah. outside of uh, all the art and the date and page number and all of that at the top so it's still it's still comic related <laughs> it's almost like you're pulling a harvey picar style of memoir then yeah it's it's, it's harvey picar by way of jonathan ames i guess nice and i saw a, vi a, a film they did a film on his life or whatever mm -hmm. too, so yes i thought that was well done i love that it's my favorite comic book movie i'll tell you my harvey picar story because sure. it's the most harvey picar story of all after he died there was a a Kickstarter to get a statue made in his honor. Mm -hmm. My, at the time, best friend, who turned out to be awful, it's in the book, is like the biggest Alan Moore fan in the entire world. And one of the rewards at the like highest level reward was a like one hour phone conversation Q&A with Alan Moore. And so I bought this for my friend. I really wanted the statue to get made. I don't know, I was in my mid twenties and it felt like it really mattered. So I ended up backing the campaign to like far more than I even had to just for that reward. It was very stupid. I was just like on a kind of big high from something and just went wild and uh, probably poppers. And part of it was they were gonna have, the statue was gonna be in the Cleveland library mm -hmm. and there would be uh, Harvey's writing desk and they'd have kind of a comic shop set up in the library area, which is kind of cool. And then they were gonna have a plaque 
with all the names of the the backers uh, mm -hmm. of a certain level. You got a library card for the Cleveland Library, and it was great. So. <laughs> Years later, my husband, uh, he, he breeds great, or he's retired from it now, but he used to breed Great Danes, uh, and he used to be a, a dog judge. We actually met when he was on assignment in New Zealand to judge a dog show. You know, he gets called up to judge the show in Cleveland, and I'm like, oh, I'll come with you. I've never been. I want to go see my name on the on the plaque. I want to see the statue and all of this. We go, we get there, and, and like, this is, this is early in our relationship, by the way. This is like at the point where I'm still trying to impress him that I'm a real serious comic boy because he doesn't know anything about comics. So he's just like, it's he's kind of taking it on faith. Like he's Googled me, but that's, you know, who knows? And so I'm like, oh yeah, no, this is, this guy's a very serious comic person. And he's got this thing and, and there's a statue of him. There's a statue of him in a library. And we get there and the statue is, this big <laughs> like little like it's like no it's like a three foot thing sitting uh, standing on his desk and it's a beautiful piece like it's it's harvey like shrugging and making his usual face it's great next to it where they said there'd be a plaque it is a printout on like an 11 uh no like 22 by 17 sheet of paper in like a comic font that's not quite comic sans but close to it of all of the names and then there's a piece of perspex bolted over over top of it and we look, and my name had absolutely been left off that list. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was, it just, but it, like, it, it was so much better than if it had been there, you know? It was just such a, like, you look at this shrugging statue, and you're like, that is exactly how I feel right now. <laughs> and that was also when my husband was like, I look like that statue, and started, like, doing a little impression of it, and I was <laughs> like, I, I love you so much. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, not many people know about Harvey Peeker these days. It's a shame. That is very sad. American Splendor is such a good movie. Yeah. Like it's comic. It's like I really like Harvey Pekar, how he seems to be as a person. Is that it's that you know yourself as brand thing, I guess. Everything about him is so interesting. I like to read five pages of American Splendor at a time and then none for months. Oh, wow. I will always happily pick up a book, flip to any random part, and I can enjoy it. I never want to read a lot of it. I have to have it somewhere near me in case I feel like it. And I love it for those five pages, but that it, it has to be like a quick dip thing. I love that he exists. I love everything about what that, like, what the, the underground comics of the past, like, created. There was a real scumbag energy to it. It was like, my friend Indra, who creates fantastic, very funny, like, comic strips, she hates, hates the, like, she calls them worthy comics, these comics that are trying to be whatever they're trying to be. She's actually the, the sort of second main character in Octopus for the first chapter. It's the night she and I became just incredibly close friends. She always talks about this, like the scumbag aesthetic. And I always say like, I hate what the scumbag aesthetic became because, you know, if you read like, like what Sontag was saying about like the zine culture, yeah. I really, really enjoy that aspect of it because so much of it was we are scraping together whatever we can to make this art. We are doing it the absolute best we can with the resources available to us. And that is why we're putting out books that are photocopied or risographed or like the, the, the art is in the obsessive detail. And I feel like then all these other things became available, like printing got cheaper and what have you. And people are now making those things to look like zines used to because that's now the visual language of them. And it's lost that energy of like, obsessive drive. I want to think of everything I make as having that kind of obsessive drive to it. Um, I, I am making scumbag art. I just push it as far as I possibly can, I guess. Well, Richard, I hate to say, but that is this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming back on the show. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> thank you for having me. Any time. Where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, when is the Kickstarter going to end and where can we find that as well? It is running for a full month. It ends at midnight on uh, February 24th and you can find it at kickrichard.com. That will be the forever home of all of my crowdfunding campaigns, kickrichard.com. My plan at the moment is that if the if there's no campaign or pre-launch running, there'll be a flash game where you get to actually kick me, but I'm having trouble putting it together. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Make it the new Flappy Bird or something like that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word, you not the number two. Of course, our YouTube channel is a lot more updated than our website because I am only one person. Give me a break. It's youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgtmedia. And the podcast is back 
after about 12 or so years, which you can find it on twogeekstalking.podbean.com. And I've already uploaded the past 100 episodes from last year, and I'm currently uploading whenever I do a interview will go on the next day on that same website. So get it on your favorite streaming service or whatever the case may be and have a blast with them. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.